Welcome back everyone to Hearts of Iron 4. Upper mod Le Deluge. You may remember this mod from quite a while ago. I did play with it and I did do a mod spotlight for it. And in this mod, there's an alternate history scenario that is very interesting. And the reason that I'm visiting it in and I'll be doing a update spotlight, aka a mod spotlight with an update for it is that it got some pretty hefty changes done to it and improvements that brought it into um, the 1.4 patch which is of course very very nice and there there have been of course a lot of upgrades to various different aspects of the mod that we shall look at so let's get right into it the premise of the mod in case you do not remember slash do not know i've never seen this is that uh, essentially Napoleon won the Napoleonic Wars, and uh, since then Europe has been struggling with various different uprisings that, of course, threaten the uh, rule of the uh, continental system, which is the, of course, alliance that the French uh, imperial, the French imperial state, is part of. And uh, we are just off a sort of a first world war in which. Um, the continental system with France and Poland, etc., etc. Uh, well, Poland uh, being the opponent, of course, fought each other, and uh, Poland and Hungary are the so-called central powers that um, fought against France. And then uh, all hell broke loose in Germany. There is a bit of a civil war going on right at the start of the game, which is on May Day, between the People's Republic of Germany, led by Fehlmann. Of course, uh, more of a socialist, ra it's called radicals, uh, who are essentially the uh, communists of the mod. Then the Teutonic Reich, led by Mackensen, being of course the fascists, or ultranationalists. And the Kingdom of Westphalia, uh, who are the monarchists and uh, the loyalists of the uh, continent, well, technically the loyalists of the continental system, supported by France. Uh, Teutons supported by uh, Poland and uh, People's Republic of Germany being uh, their kind of their own supporters. Of course, there's also various different areas around the map that aren't what we expect. The Ottoman Empire is still around and can go various different ways. There's uh, a lot of Spain around uh, because, of course, Spain was um, sort of a client state of France. They've been able to keep good relations, and they've spread around. Of course, America is much different. It's actually a kingdom instead of a uh, republic, and it has to face another republic, which is the Socialist Republic of Quebec. Then there's a lot of different nations, such as Louisiana. Of course, with a stronger France, the Louisiana Purchase does not happen, and so uh, there's a French kingdom straight down the middle of uh, France, where actually the uh, Bourbons from mainland France fled to after uh, Napoleon of course won the civil war and there was no restoration after uh, 1814 and the uh, of Vienna etc etc and then there is the Christian Republic of the Seret of course without a connection to um, the mainland United States federal kingdom there these people are independent and they're doing their own thing they also have part of uh, what we today would think of as Canada and they're quite uh, interesting altogether, and of course, Russia still has parts of Alaska. Russia being still an empire led by the Romanovs, but having some problems. Of course, we have the Socialist Republic of Ukraine led by Makhno, and two of its uh, sort of uh, comrades in misfortune the Republican Republic of Belarusia and the Socialist Baltic Socialist Republic, plus the uh, Caucasian Democratic Republic. So you have a sort of an axis of revolution, I guess you could call it, between Ukraine, Caucasians, and Baltics, with Belarus being caught in the crosshairs along with uh, Russia and their Finnish puppet, the Grand Duchy of Finland. There is a Kingdom of Sweden and Denmark up here, which is liberal democratic, and there is a French mandate of Pomerania, which is a disputed territory between the now fractured Germany, Poland, and of course, um, 
that can cause quite a lot of conflict later on. There's still, of course, the Austrian Empire around, not having been destroyed in uh, our version of the Great War with Otto I, and still holding Südtirol in Italy, well, modern Italy, and uh, of course Istria. Then for Italy we have the Italian Empire, led by the ultra-nationalists under Mussolini, so pretty much nothing uh, too different for um, for Italy, except they have a uh, French king instead of uh, Vittorio Emanuele III, which would be the king normally. You have a descendant of Murat, uh, of course uh, put into power by Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars, survived all the way through here. Uh, the problem mainly for Italy is that of course France is up in there, um, pretty much has its own interests in Piedmont which is, uh, of course, its own core state, having been kept after the Napoleonic Wars. And so Italy has quite a lot to do in terms of uh, land to reclaim. The Balkans are a mess, as they normally are, with a strong Magyar Empire uh, that is allied, of course, to Poland, who is uh, very, very strong. And they actually have Kostuski, uh in charge, and they're ultra-nationalists as well. There's a pretty decent Romania that are normally aligned with France. There's a Croatia, which usually ends up being aligned to Poland, a Serbia, a pretty uh, expanded Bulgaria, and of course, Greece and Albania. Then, moving on to the Middle East, we have, of course, the Ottoman Empire, Nejd, which hasn't formed Saudi Arabia, I guess you could uh, say formed Saudi Arabia. It hasn't united Arabia because Hejaz is still under the Ottoman rule, having there been no Arab revolt. Yemen, Oman... Abu Dhabi, all the things you do expect, Bahrain here, oh no, actually Qatar, uh, Qatar and Bahrain, Persia, and then uh, we have a divide in India, of course there is a British India, but considering that Britain in this timeline is of course not quite as strong as it would normally be, there's also a fully united Ireland by the way, uh, of course India, British India is lacking a few pieces, namely a Portuguese India and a French India. Uh, all of these are, by the way, very much, um, I guess, incorporated into uh, Together for Victory. If you have that DLC, the playing experience for Upper Ma is going to be very, very good. Because there's all these colonials that can uh, break away, you can play, and you can do some very nice things with. There's also, of course, French in China, Siam, Burma, uh, pretty big Afghanistan. Um, of course, not having quite as many problems with uh, Britain and Russia as in our own timeline. There's actually a demilitarized zone? Oh no, that's an impassable terrain. Okay, never mind. There's of course a Tibet that is just there. And then in Asia, the Qing Empire is still around, even though they still have the the five uh, five men flag, aka the five nation flag. They've still got Pui as a ruling um, monarch, but they have a bit of a problem. They have the Heavenly Kingdom who were uh, in our own timeline. Uh, a bit of a rebellion that happened in the early 1800s around this area of Nanjing, so eastern coastal China, that was essentially led by a Christian sect, and uh, their leader is supposed to be the uh, younger brother of Christ, of course, and uh, these are essentially a, the a theocracy that are supposed to be, uh, well, they're ultra-nationalist in the way that they are represented in the mod, and they also have some interesting things that they can do. Now, um, of course, there's a Japan and a few uh, normal uh, countries around, well, countries, colonial nations around the Oceanic Theater. Uh, there's a Republic of the Philippines, and of course, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the Dutch East Indies are pretty much as you expect. Also, British Malaya. There is an independent Hawaii, though. Uh, that's kind of nice. And they're, of course, a puppet of Great Britain in the Commonwealth. In South America, you have a still uh, surviving Emperor of Brazil with a huge uh, Rio de la Plata Democratic um, Republic and a Gran Colombia that it still exists. So, of course, uh, there's a few mega states, I guess you could call them, in South America. Of course, not quite as much uh, development for uh, the mod could have been actually been sunk into South America, so uh, not quite as developed as the rest of the world. And of course, Africa is divided in some ways that you expect, and in some ways that you do not. In fact, there are some American colonies. Here you can see that they have, uh, of course, Liberia as their puppet, as you'd expect. It's a Grand Duchy, though, and not a Republic. 
then they have Togo, is that? No, Ghana, never mind, that's Togo. Uh, and then, of course, Nigeria and Cameroon under their control. Then there is Sweden Denmark that has the Congo. Uh, lacking, of course, a Belgium, technically. There is a Grand Duchy of Luxembourg that is a puppet of France, and a Republic of the Netherlands, which is a um, sort of puppet of the French Empire uh, that very much aligned to France due to uh, proximity. So that's the rundown of how uh, the geography looks. As to actual me mechanics, the mod does add some. Now, uh, the focus tree is mostly one of um, an interesting system where there's a generic focus tree that is replicated among most countries with some ch uh, changes. For example, you can see um, the Socialist Republic of Germany has the Great Leap Forward in their um, sort of political tree and a few different things, whereas a normal focus tree, like the Socialist Republic of Ukraine, oh no, that's actually, uh, never mind. Uh, like, for example, the Persian Empire would have just a few different um, generic uh, focuses for uh, various different politics that they could do. All of these uh, are nice because they give both a drift towards different ideologies and also bonuses towards one or, or your other aspects of your country. So. What they do is that if you want to go in a certain direction, you're going to have to accept either switching to an ideology or having to deal with the drift um, towards a certain ideology. And that's what kind of makes this nice, along with the fact that there are no more only three ideologies, but there are four. There's ultranationalist, democratic, monarchist, and um, of course, democratic. Then there is a pretty generic economy tree that's kind of similar for everybody and a um, military one that's also, I believe, kind of similar for everybody. Some countries, like uh, Russia, have also, after they complete their political focus trees, a lot of claims that they can gain, and uh, that also causes events and various different um, cores to spring up for, of course, uh, the person that uh, initiates the focus. But also, uh, of course, because of the events, there can be different outcomes and different crises that happen at various different times around the game. So uh, the AI is indeed quite active with these, and it can lead to various different organic wars springing out about the place. Uh, what there's there's also the kind of um, chance for various different countries by event to initiate kind of blocks of countries uh, that uh, essentially make factions. So for example, there's the Chinese block and the Russian block that are available right at the start for those two countries. And uh, different nations can also uh, form their own blocks. For example, one that's very common is the American block, but there's also others such as uh, the Ottoman block. Uh, well, I've also seen the Spanish block once, the Austrian block, the Italian block. There's all these different factions that can rise up and, uh, of course, try to challenge the continental system, the central powers, and the Commonwealth for dominance. And there's also the East Asian sphere for Japan, as uh, should have been uh, known. There's still some concessions, by the way, around. So if you like concessions, there's also those. Then there's a few countries that can basically just go... Uh, so, okay, so there's some countries that are kind of set in what they're going to be doing. So for example, France, the Socialist Republic of Germany, uh, of course, the various different Germanys altogether, Poland, and sometimes Russia, pretty much all go uh, the same route every game. But then there's some countries like Great Britain that can have various different paths and that uh, can uh, lead to a lot of different things. For example, for Britain, you have, near the start of the game, an event that lets you choose between various different parties, uh, monarchists, ultranationalists, and um, monarchists, wait, no, monarchists, ultranationalists, and democratic. That, of course, determines what you're going to be doing, and that's very, very cool, uh, because sometimes the AI is very slow in doing different things, and so having events forcing um, alignments down. Some countries, for example, Great Britain, but also the Ottoman Empire are two examples that come to mind, is uh, pretty uh, good, just to know what their leanings are going to be from the start. Then, of course, um, uh, there's the League of Nations, which is another interesting mechanic that they added, or that he added, because I believe it's still only one guy that develops this, which is very impressive. And the League of Nations is initiated by uh, France, who, of course, being the dominant power in the world, is trying to be the world police and try to keep nations from fighting each other because, of course, 
they're going to profit from peace. And they can initiate the League of Nations, which um, essentially is just like our own, a supranational organization that tries to pass various different international laws to limit various different actions from certain countries. For example, poison gas usage, uh, treatment of prisoners of war, uh, the protection of trade from um, unrestricted submarine warfare, etc., etc. And these are very nice because uh, from the text you don't really understand, but uh, what ends up happening is that uh, once you uh, essentially uh, create the League of Nations, various different countries have the option to join or leave the League of Nations. Uh, of course, it is part of the focus tree. And then... Once you join, you will get events once France um, tries to pass, uh, of course, various different resolutions. I'm just going to call them resolutions, I don't exactly know uh, the exact term. So, for example, if they want to create an international court of justice, you can then, in the event, say, oh, I am for this or I am against this, and then the votes will be counted, and depending on whether or not uh, that vote passes, once France does the ratification, uh, ratification of the treaties, essentially the various different bonuses and malices that um, various different countries voted for will be applied. So that's really, really cool because you have a phase where you're just setting everything up, you're uh, sort of writing uh, the constitution of the League of Nations, and then you have the ratifications and uh, everybody is asked uh, to, of course, join or not. And then those bonuses will be applied for the rest of the game, unless, of course, leave the League of Nations, which increases world tension. So that is a very, very nice little system that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, whenever I play, it's just very nice to see who um, who leaves, who joins, who does this or that with the League of Nations. And then you can, uh, of course, always have your own calculations as to which, which different votes will be good for your country or not. Uh, there aren't really any big problems at this point for Upper Mali Deluge. Um, it's, of course, not quite as developed as Kaiserreich, because the Kaiserreich has been going on for years and years and years. But it is, of course, very, very nice to play. Uh, there's also a lot of new laws uh, that have been added for um, your country. So there's different monetary policies, voting, which affects uh, drifts within your country, and the social order that affects various different uh, economics of the country. Then there's a lot of ministers. What's also nice is that, just like in the focus tree, there's various different, um, I guess you could call them demagogues or uh, political advisors, that do both um, work in your economy and in your ideologies. So for example, I wanted more resource gain. Oh well, this guy also is going to give me monarchist drift. Or I wanted some more production efficiency. This guy's also going to give me radicals because he's a trade unionist and such and such. And then there's also the vanilla, uh, just pure drift people uh, that, of course, are just going to be changing around the ideologies of the country. Uh, then there's, of course, the normal ones like the captains of industry, the war industrialists, uh, you know, what you'd expect. Pretty much normal stuff. Resource and production, there are um, some... Um, ported over from the standard game for, uh, of course, tech designers. And then there's also uh, generic, I believe, for everybody. Uh, chiefs of the army, navy, air force, etc. Let's actually check for France, because if anybody has unique things, it's probably France. Okay, France does have unique um, advisors, which is nice, of course. But they don't have unique, for example, oh no, they do have Renault and AMX. Okay, so France does have uh, unique stuff. Yeah, there's of course going to be a few countries that have more um, flavor than... Oh, is it still so E? Okay, uh, that have more flavor than others, but pretty much most of them have their parties named and their leaders set. Uh, so for example, you have the missionary movement, even for something like the Seret, which uh, would be the ES, right? Yes. And of course, you can see that uh, everybody has their own leaders. I believe some of them are going to be generic, but most of them are going to have their own portraits. Uh, some of them are going to fit better than others. For example, I really like Albert McKay's uh, President of the Seret 
portrait. And of course, you're gonna be able to switch around everything as you like. Um, pretty much, yeah, that's about it. Uh, of course, there's also national spirits for various different countries, for example. China has the feudal superstitions, which decreases factory output and recruitable pop to nerf it a little bit, because as you can see, China starts off really, really big. Not that well developed, but of course, with uh, huge amounts of manpower, they're going to be able to do quite a lot of damage to any opponent. So to nerf it a little bit, there was... Um, hmm, they're actually starting at limited conscription, which is pretty insane. Yeah, to, to nerf it a little bit, there is a national spirit. Then there's also some national spirits for, for example, Russia, uh, with the Great War Horrors. And of course, France, Great War Horrors as well. Italy has... Uh, their own king, just like France, etc. Great Britain, everybody has their own king. And I believe there's also different national spirits that can pop up at various different times. Uh, so, for example, for the socialists, who have their own kind of unique focus tree, they can um, do, for example, the Great Leap Forward, which is going to give them military construction speed. And uh, in general, there's... Um, Quite a few different things they can form different factions they can get claims and that's of course different for various uh, countries so for example ukraine they're gonna get um also the ability to join the comic-con but they're not gonna have their own claims they're gonna have to do it by yourself <laughs> they have the politburo of course um yeah that's pretty much about it i don't remember if italy has any yeah italy does have some unique Things. They have the Rome. Oh, they can they can do the Roman Empire, of course, because they have uh, Mussolini, and they can do the pose the monarchy and become <laughs> the Italian Social Republic, of course, uh, because they're uh, Social Republic because they're of course ultra nationalist to start. But I'm guessing that they're gonna have different um, names for various different Italian republics. So Italy also very heavily developed and uh, flavorful. Then, I'm not sure about the Balkan countries, probably not too much. Oh no, they do have... Oh, Unify Yugoslavia, oh that's amazing. So you become the king of Yugoslavia, you can do that stuff as well. And yeah, uh, I believe also Austria has some interesting stuff. Yeah, they can um, become Austria-Hungary instead of just Austria. Because I believe they also have some problems at the start with Hungary, right? No, they don't. Oh, weird. I thought they did. Oh well. So yeah, that's gonna be pretty much it. So I want to thank you all for watching. Hope you will enjoy the mod. As always, the link will be in the description and the credit goes to the developer. Uh, by the way, there's also this. United Republic of Central America and Santa Cruz in uh, here, with Spain being controlled of the, uh, the Caribbean along with the USA, in case you were wondering what was there. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you soon. Um, I can't right now play uh, another sort of series of Hearts of Iron 4, there's just way too much going on, and so I'm going to be holding off, but probably soon enough I'm going to be starting um, a let's play of this. So in the comments below, if you're interested, please do tell what kind of uh, nation do you want me to play, and of course, some tips for anything that you'd want to uh, see. So yeah, thank you all for watching, hope you've enjoyed, hope you'll try it out, and I'll see you soon.